Hey everybody. <laughs> All right, welcome to part one of bushcraft camping and survival tips and tricks. Okay, now, <clears throat> or it may be tips, tricks, and talk. I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, basically what it is is uh, things get loaded up with messages that get sent to me and comments that I just can't answer, that I have to show things on, and just things in general that I want to show that basically have nowhere else to go in any, in, it, this doesn't fit in any of the videos. Just kind of little odds and ends and things that I don't know where they belong. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is uh, some bits will be long, some will be short, some will be indoor, some will be outdoor, but uh, <clears throat> I hope it's uh, interesting. Uh, you can follow along with it. Uh, at this point, I know it's going to be two parts. It may be three parts. I don't know. I haven't edited. I just know I've been filming for like four or five days straight. And uh, some good, some bad, some may get cut. I don't know. <laughs> so, let's get going with it. One of the old tried and true methods of uh, water purification and carrying water and like a maybe a, a survival tip is people will carry these metal water bottles, okay? And they'll put like a, they use it for carrying water, they carry it for, uh, it's metal, so they'll boil water in it in a fire. And in cases of sometimes where you can't get a fire going, a lot of times people will have a cloth with two rubber bands wrapped around their bottle. And see, so that way, whenever you come across a, a, a reasonably clean creek, or whenever you're going to boil it, you can take your cloth and you put your cloth over the top of it and then you put your rubber band around it. And then what you do is you just lay it in the creek and as the water comes in from upstream, the water will be filtered. Now it won't be purified, but it'll be filtered, which is pretty good. In a really bad situation, you might could drink that, but you really need to boil it. Now another thing that you could do with this is that you can take this cloth and the way it's doubled over, you can put charcoal in it and cram the charcoal down in it and then fold another layer over the top of your charcoal and then put the rubber band around it. Now a friend of mine, we were discussing one time that they had noted that sometimes these rubber bands wear out and break. And sometimes they'll wear out and break a lot quicker than you think. So if that's the case, what you want to do is instead of the rubber bands, you want to get a strainer. It's a sink strainer. You can get them in any plumbing department of like uh, Lowe's or Home Depot or Ace Hardware or something. And they've got a, it's just a little stainless steel basket. And what you do is you just hook it on your lid and you just carry it with you so that you don't lose it. Okay. Now, the way this thing works is you take your cloth, you cover your opening there with a the cloth, and then the basket strainer will shove right down inside. Another thing that you can do with it is you can take this. Let me lay this down where you can see it. You can take your cloth and you can put your charcoal from your fire in it right here and double it over so that you're going to have a little pouch of charcoal in here. And then what you do with it is you set it on here and cram it down in there so that this opening underneath this is filled with charcoal. And then you just take it and you lay it in a creek upstream. Lay your cloth on, shove in your strainer, find a part of the stream where the water is flowing coming from upstream, and you just set your bottle in the stream and put a rock over it, just like that, and then when you come back, it'll be full of water. Let's talk about uh, storing things in stuff sacks 
or things that are in compression sacks. Now, the reason that they make things that pack up into small little packs is so that you can get them into your backpack. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that is just for the trip. <laughs> that is not necessarily meant for a permanent storage option. Like, this is an air mattress. And see how it's just, it's just crushed in there? That's not good. You don't, you don't want to leave it stored like that. That's only for your backpacking trip. So what you want to do with your air mattresses is like this. Take off the stuff sack, okay, and leave it laying over it or laying with it. And what you want to do is you want to blow it up, okay? Blow it up and leave it somewhere. Because having these things folded over and crushed all the time is not good. Because everywhere that this thing is crushed, every corner, slowly weakens it over time. You want it to be out, blown up, have nice crisp edges, and it'll blow up better. Okay, even this, especially the self-inflating kind. Now, <clears throat> the if you have like a, a, a goose down bag or any kind of bag, especially the bags that have the Prima Loft in them, uh, like this is my uh, my um, snug pack jungle b uh, bag. What you want to do is you want to hang it up. And the best hangers are those hangers where they sell like those quilts at Christmas time, and they've got like a wooden bar. You can hang them up however you want to, but these seem to work good for me. And so what I do is I will hang up my bag when I'm not using it. And then the stuff sack, the compression sack, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll, I'll hang it from the hanger, okay? And I'll put it up here, all right? So the same thing with my, if I have a Prima Loft blanket, this is my uh, snug pack jungle blanket. Same thing with it. I don't want it permanently crushed. I want it to be nice and lofty. So I don't want to comp permanently compress the insulative qualities of the blanket. All right, so, and what I do is whenever I'm fixing to go backpacking, I'll pick my gear out, put it in a compression sack, put it in my backpack, and I'll go. And same thing for my poncho liners. Now, my poncho liners, they don't have a, um, they don't come with a compression sack. But I go ahead and I keep them hanging up anyway so that they'll stay nice and lofty and they will keep their insulated qualities. So I keep them hanging up too, all right? Regular old, back, uh, regular old sleeping bags doesn't really matter because they're not in a compression sack. I'm mainly talking about anything that gets compressed down for backpacking size, okay? Now those are the ones that have the insulative qualities. So let's ease on over here and look. I also want to talk about rain pants. Okay, now these are my Sierra Design rain pants, and they come with a stuff sack too. Okay, now these are not insulated. They're not like my blankets or my bags. When it starts raining, they are rain pants. You put them on over your pants when you're not using them. They're in the stuff sack so they don't take up much room. Okay, now they should only be in the stuff sack when you're not backpacking. Okay, because the idea behind these. You're not worried about crushing the insulation with these. What you're worried about is when these things are in that compression sack and they're all crushed up and you've got those sharp points right there, what you're doing is you're, you're permanently weakening the material, okay? And that will get weaker and weaker over time. And then as it stretches back out, it'll form a hole a lot quicker. So if you want to extend the life of your rain pants, Hang them up too. Take them out of the bag and put them in the bag when you're going backpacking. Usually what I'll do is I'll, I won't even carry this in my backpack. I'll carry them in the pack in my side pocket of my pants. That way when it starts raining, I'll just pull it right out of my side pocket and, I, and I'll put them on. But you want to keep these things nice and smooth, you know, so that you don't prematurely wear them out too quick. But yeah, hang everything up. <laughs> Now this next little uh, jewel, <clears throat> I can't take credit for because this is an old Ray Mears trick and I don't know how many people seen it because I haven't seen that many people doing it, but it's how to split wood with just a bow saw. Alright, 
so what you want to do is you want to saw you out a piece of wood okay and preferably you want one that's got a nice natural split going to it like this so what you want to do is you want to lay it down with the split going this way just like that and then you want to saw right over the top of it halfway down You got this crack out on the end, and you got it sawed halfway now that it's down. Sawed, to the crack. What you do is you just find a tree and you give it a good whack. That is how you split wood with a saw. Now you may be wondering why I'm sitting in here in the computer room <laughs> and why I'm holding a roll of something that has a very weird reflective quality. <laughs> well, uh, this is going to take a little bit of explaining. And what this is, is this is Trizac. Okay, it's an abrasive made by 3M Company. Some very cool stuff. Now I'm going to ease you over here to the computer because I have a terrible memory and I can't explain it without showing you. <laughs> all right i am on this is going to look weird because computers always look weird on camera i'm under a site called super grit okay there's plenty of plenty of sites on here and as you can see i have just brought this up and it's showing all these different belts and this is 3m structured abrasive trizac okay what that is is that's fancy talk for a very very technical sanding belt now if you come on down here to the very bottom you've got a four inch by 132 inch but trizac belt twelve dollars all right this is what i want you to see a belt that big can be cut into pieces and will last you forever and this will make more sense in a minute as the pyramid structures wear fresh layers of sharp material is exposed delivering consistent finishes at cooler temperatures excellent for sharpening steel knives okay this is why i'm showing you this okay a company called super grit sells it a bunch of other places sell it but a lot of times you have to buy a lot of belts okay 3m structured trizac okay there's a belt right there four by 132 now let's go back in the other room so we can talk a little bit more about this I explained what a uh, Trizac was. It's an abrasive. Now when you buy it in a long roll like this right here, or a belt, what you do is you just cut it off into small pieces as you need them. And what you do with those small pieces <clears throat> is, years ago what I used to do is I would take pieces of leather, all right? Let me ease you down here where you can see a little bit better. What I used to do is I used to take pieces of leather, like from boots, and I would cut them up, and I would glue sandpaper to the other side. And what I've, when I found this stuff called Trizac abrasive, what it is, it's like it said on the website, it's uh, got little microscopic pyramids that as they wear away, more appear. So it never wears out. Or it, it does wear out, but it lasts a lot longer than sandpaper. When I would glue the sandpaper to this leather, it wouldn't last any time. And <clears throat> so it stays flexible when you glue it to it. It's easy to carry. And the beauty of it is <clears throat> you can, while you're at camp, you can take the leather side and you can use the leather to strop your knife. And normally what I'll do is I'll set this on a log or a, a split piece of wood or if I find just the right rock. And then on the other side, on the Trizac side, you can use it. I use it for sharpening my machetes. And it really excels at sharpening an axe. And it just it lasts a whole lot longer than sandpaper. Now, it won't necessarily make a machete or an axe uh, sharp from a dull 
state but if you have one and you and it, you don't let it it gets just a tiny bit dull you can maintain it with this and uh, the other thing about it the other thing about it is the fact that it's glued to a piece of leather flexible leather you can also use it for handling your hot cookware while you're at camp all right so that's what it is like i said i used to if you can't find the trizac this is a little trick you can just you can just glue sandpaper to leather and as it wears down you can replace it but to me it seems like this trizac is the only thing that lasts a long time and remains quite flexible. Let's talk about ferro rods a minute, losing them and how important it can be. Uh, all, all survival enthusiasts have ferro rods and most bushcrafters do and some campers do. So uh, the way I like to carry ferro rods is on paracord. Carry it around your neck, all right? Now, if by some chance your paracord comes undone, or even worse, if you're using it and you set it down, it can be lost. And in a bad situation, it being lost could be like a death sentence. All right. So what you can do is either buy orange paracord or orange shoelaces. Okay. Now the idea about shoelaces is the first thing you want to do with your ferro rod is you loop it through all right, and then you tie it in a knot. All right, that way, when you tie it around your neck, in case it falls off and gets lost, you've got all this orange, bright orange shoelace where you can see it laying on the ground. Almost like when you're hiking or walking around or making a fire, you'll reach up, oh no, my ferro rod's gone, and then there it is, bright orange. But one good way to doing it, if it really, really means your life, wrap it around your neck, okay? And then what you do, hold on, got my, got my do-rag in the way. Wrap it around your neck and tie it off once. And then wrap it around your neck again and tie it off again, okay? That way you've got three chances of not losing your ferro rod. You got one loop that'll come undone. When it does, it may drop down and you'll see it. And that other loop may hold it, but if it comes undone, then when it finally does come undone, you'll see it because you've got the orange, you got the orange uh, shoelace or paracord on it. Ain't that neat? <laughs> one of the things that's uh, pretty bad that can happen to you when you're out in a wilderness, uh, if you're in a bad situation, or even really, if you think about it, just camping, <laughs> is if you lose your knife. Uh, Morris Kohansky used to always preach about uh, tying a ribbon to the end of your knife so that that way, if it ever fell into the deep snow, uh, <clears throat> as it fell, like whenever he would, if he, in the past, whenever people would drop knives in the deep snow, they would just shoot down through a little hole and before long you can never find them again but if you had a ribbon tied to them the ribbon would be floating kind of out there and you could see it and grab hold of the ribbon and pull your knife out of the snow well i don't ever have to deal with big heavy snow but around here in some of the swamps and some of the wetlands and anytime i'm near a creek or a lake or anything anytime you're over water there's certain things you can do to keep you from losing your knife or if you do lose your knife this is a good way of finding it and <clears throat> I had said and uh, I can't remember when it's going to show up in a video but I had talked about uh, orange shoelaces buy them in bulk quantity <laughs> they're great for like tying ferro rods around your neck and they're good for other things too so let's take a look right down here uh, one of the other things that you can do with them is uh, Let's see, let's lift you up a little bit right over here. Right, that's better. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that you can do is like, say, for example, if you're going to be using your knife in a swamp or a wetlands or whatever, you can just take the shoelace here. Now, I'm not real sure if paracord floats. It's weird. I've been around paracord all my life, and I honestly don't know if it floats or not. 
So you can get orange paracord, but the shoelaces, the way it's like the flat ribbon seems to work a lot better. But you can just tie a tail, a dual tail to it, or if the water's deep enough, tie a single tail to it. And that way, whenever you're using your knife, if you happen to drop it, whether you're in the snow or in, in the near a swamp or near wetlands or whatever, uh, that right there will save it. Okay. And while we're on the subject, there's another little, uh, little trick for knives. Let's say that you've got a knife and you're in a boat and you're doing something with that knife or you're near a creek or you're near water anything like that, uh, you po could possibly drop your knife and if you drop it, it's gone forever. So, another little trick that you can do is have a big bobber. <laughs> and on that bobber, have you a loop, I don't know if you can see it or not, but have a loop of a uh, fishing line on it. And what you want to do with that is uh, over, over your lanyard, loop the fishing line over and put the bobber in and tighten it off. All right. Ease you back up there. And as you can see now, what I have is I have, there's a bobber hanging right here over the fishing line. I mean, on, on the end of my knife. And so the great, the beauty of this is, is you can be using your knife and if you drop it and as it sails into the water, the bobber will hold it up. There's many, many, many a times that this could come in very handy to keep you from losing your knife. And, you know, especially like if you're in a kayak, if you're in a canoe, if you're in a boat, and uh, then all you got to do is you'll, your knife won't be in the bottom of the, the lake or the river, and you'll just see the bobber floating along, and you just reach down and grab it, pull it out, and there's, there's your knife, you know. Neat, handy little trick. And if you're in a boat, you're probably going to have a bobber and, and a fishing line anyway. I got into a discussion slash argument with a guy one time. that He was telling me that he said he had no reason to carry a compass. That he said he had such a good sense of direction and had spent so many years in the woods that he knew, he automatically knew which direction he was going in. And, uh, you know, not only do people have a dominant leg, which causes you to walk in circles, but there's so many obstacles in the way in the woods, I don't see how you could keep up with your sense of direction. Now, if you're out on the flat lanes and you can see off in the distance, that's, that's a different thing because you can assume your direction and pick an object and then walk to it. And only to that one object. That's called dead reckoning, okay? Now, out here in the woods, to me, I feel like you need a compass, okay? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little exercise that I would like for you to do at home. So, what you do is you take your compass, okay, and you pick a direction in the woods. Now, let's ease you down here. Okay, that's north. So what I'm going to do I'll we'll put the camera up this way. <clears throat> I'm going to take both of my hands like this. I'm going to hold my hands straight out. And when it's pointing towards north, I'm going to walk that way. And I'm going to walk 65 paces without looking at the compass. And then I'm going to pull the compass out and see if I'm still aimed north. And that's something that I think that you could do to test your own sense of direction in the woods. So what I'm going to do... Alright, now. So what I'm going to do is right on the other side of this big tree, I'm going to jump over this creek and I'm going to walk that direction 65 paces. Now, a pace is every time your left foot hits, lifts up and hits the ground, that's a pace. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't count with your right foot, okay?
Now this is probably pretty sloppy filming because what I'm doing is uh, I don't have my steady cam with me. I'm just carrying the tripod. Now what I'm doing, there's so many objects here that I'm having to pick out that I'm just, I'm just, I'm trying to eyeball a straight line. I'm just, I'm just trying to walk in a straight line. And whenever I come to an object, what I'm trying to do is every time I come to object, the one object I'm going to the left of, and the next object I'm going to the right of. Oh, spider way of, it's wonderful. Whew. Where was I? 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. Alright, I'm at 65. Let's get the compass out and take a look. I'm standing right here. And up here where you can see right right out in front of me. Alright, I'm seeing it when you're seeing it. Now this is not trying to make myself look great. It's not trying to make myself look bad. It's just testing myself and this is a test that you can do. Okay, both hands, I'm holding the compass straight out. This is what I thought I was walking in a straight line. And there you go. I'm going to pull it back to me. And I am 20 degrees off. It's at 340. I am 20 degrees off. Okay, now, like I said, I didn't do this. I didn't do this to make myself look bad or look inaccurate because I could brag too and say, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of time in the woods. I spent a whole lifetime in the woods walking around. But simply put, the thing is, is you just, you've got to keep an eye on where you're going in the thick woods. I mean, look around at this place. There's, there's all kinds of objects to go around. Totally different if it's in the flatlands. Completely, totally different. But when you think about it, just take a look around at every single obstacle out here. There are just so many ways to get off course. And when you're out in the middle of the nowhere and you're trying to follow a direction and you think you're walking in a straight line, being 10 or 20 degrees off can kill you. I know everybody has heard of a bed roll, okay? A bed roll is like your sleep kit. You know, foam pad, blanket, bag, all mixed up, all you know, all rolled up, ready to go, okay? Well, what I want to talk about now, it's got a little history behind it. It's called the Ed Roll. <laughs> Not a bad roll, but an Ed Roll. Uh, people that's followed my videos, they've known that uh, my mentors had weird names. There was Flathead Ed and Big Nose Mac, okay? Well, Flathead Ed was the kind of guy that he believed in two uses for every device you carry, okay? And he tried to incorporate that in his gear. And not only did he do that, but he also had his weird ways, okay? Now, like, for example, this jewel here, it's an old military backpack. I mean, it's an old military uh, sleep, sleep roll, bed roll. I think it's, it's either Dutch or Swedish. I'm not real sure, but it's a big old heavy whopper of a of a bed roll and he used it and he hated it so he gave it to me and the reason that he didn't like it you get in you get in and you zip yourself up and you're you're very confined in it right he didn't like that 
And uh, so he gave that jewel to me. And the way he did things is I have some things that's going to kind of emulate the way he did things. But what he would do is he felt like and if you had to carry extra clothing, then why not make it a part of your sleep system? Your backup clothing could be your sleep system because, you know, it's like they say, some people they claim, like for example, they say, okay, I've got a jacket, all right? I've got an M65 field jacket and I've got a liner, all right? And I'm gonna wear that liner and I've got a hood that I'm gonna wear and then when the time comes, I'm just going to lay down on the ground or lay up against a tree, and I'm going to sleep. Well, from experience, if you do that, you will freeze to death. Because when you're wearing this all day and you're hiking, you are going to sweat like a pig. And any kind of moisture in your clothes is going to make you freeze to death at night. Everything, socks, underwear, your jacket, everything. You, If you wore it during the day and you hiked in it and your body is constantly perspiring and the moisture of your body and the heat of your body, it's going to get in your clothes and you're going to freeze to death. And that's why a lot of times uh, I won't even have a liner in my jacket. I'll have my uh, liner separate. So, and that way if it really gets cold, I'll put it in, and that way if it's really cold, then I won't sweat. So, back to the Ed Roll, okay? This is something similar to what he would use. And what it was is, let me undo it all. There's nothing insulative about this. And there was a lot of nights that I would be freezing, and he would be perfectly fine with nothing no insulation and I don't know maybe he was tougher than me but <clears throat> basically what he had was a cover and inside of course there was a foam pad a very light foam pad now this foam pad this is like a BV cover the BV cover no insulative qualities whatsoever weighs a little less than a pound all right so what we're going to do here let's set this up here on the table and I'm going to talk about what he would do. Now, his favorites, you might not necessarily could find. He would wear this thing. This is called a heat retentive sleep shirt. Okay? Now, I don't even know if they make these or not anymore. They're kind of hard to find, but what it is, is it's, it's like 80% nylon and... Uh, 20% uh, triacetate. And what this is, is it's intentionally meant to sleep in. It's, it's heat retentive, and not only is it heat retentive, but it's uh, moisture resistant too. If you can ever find these things, these are just fantastic. Okay, If you can't find them, then we've got these, you know, these modern things here, like this uh, Under Armour uh, heat gear. There's a tag on it. Under Armour heat, heat gear. I don't know if you can see it or not. But anyway, um, that's a good that's a good modern lightweight uh, substitution, but it just is nowhere near as warm as this. Okay, so what he would do with that, take that. Easy down here to where his roll is. Okay, I've got his roll rolled out right here. What he would do with that, First thing you would do is lay that down and fold it over just like that. Okay? Alright, so he's back up here. Now, he would be like, if it gets really, really, really cold, now when you're hiking, you don't want a whole bunch of insulation on, okay? Not unless you're in a dang blizzard. Because when you're hiking, you're going to be sweating. So, when you have on the heat retention shirt, then you take your jacket liner, you put your jacket liner on over that shirt, all right? Now the modern ones, they've added extra buttons so that you can button it up. It used to be the older ones just had the holes in them where they were buttoned into your jacket, but the modern ones, they have extra buttons 
on them so that you can actually, you can put them on and you can button them up. Okay. So what you're going to do now is you're going to picture here, this is Ed. He's got on his heat retentive shirt and he's got on his jacket liner. Okay. All this stuff was in his BB cover, wrapped up. It's not, he hasn't sweated in it. It's not dirty. So he's going to wrap it up and he's going to put it there. Now, if he's in a blizzard, whatever, really, really cold, he's got nice, dry, insulated materials. His pants. Pants liners. Okay? If he gets caught in a terrible, terrible, terrible blizzard, wind, cold, wind, rain, he's, he's going to put on these two items under his clothes and put his poncho over him so he'll stay dry. But this is what he's going to sleep in good dry okay that's the other part of it now these are his clothes these are his insulative clothes that he will sleep in okay uh, now for the head covering like me I would wear a toboggan all throughout the day and I've heard of people saying before oh I'm gonna wear a toboggan and I'll sleep in it at night no you're not you're gonna wear one during the day and then you're gonna wear one at night you'll have one in your kit okay but let's go a step further Let's go with a balaclava, all right? That way you don't have to have a neck wrap. You're going to have this thing all around your neck. Now, uh, I can't explain why, but in my experience, I would use a, a fleece or a polyester one in the dry cold, just dry, dry cold. I think this is a Rothko, okay? For snow, uh, moist, rainy cold I will wear a polypropylene one okay this is made by Manzella it's polypropylene I got it from Camp Moore I don't know of anywhere else you can get a true polypropylene one uh, so that's going to go in too now most of your cold is going to be lost from your head your hands and your feet so you've got your balaclava Wool glove liners. You haven't warmed during the day. You haven't worked in them. You haven't sweated in them. They're going to keep your hands warm. They go in. All right. Now, nowadays they have the modern wool sock liner. Okay. So what Ed used to do is he used to just take the old polyester dress socks and he would wear them. And then he would wear the thickest socks he could find. <laughs> and like I said, when you know the, the, the socks that you wear when you're hiking... Uh, you're going to get them all hot and sweaty. So he would have a fresh set of thin polyester type. I mean, he knew this stuff way years before this stuff got popular. <laughs> he just, he knew he, with the thin dress socks, he would wear them underneath there, and then he would wear these over on the outside. Okay. Now that, I think, yes, that covers everything right there. Okay. And then we've got the pad right here. Okay. Throw on the foam pad. So we got this big mess of clothes right here. Okay, we've got all these, we got all these socks, we got these these things. And see, not only was this a part of his sleep kit, but in his mind he felt like he needed to carry extra stuff anyway. So what he would do is he would take his liner and he would cram all this stuff in. And he would wrap it all up just like this. Now see the thing is, is this with the materials that he chose to wear, the stuff was, uh, it was a big roll. But the reason that he used uh, pants liners and jacket liners and things like that, yeah, he wound up with a big old bulky roll, but it didn't weigh much. It didn't weigh much at all. And what he would do is he would strap this little jewel here on the top of his backpack. And I swear, the old man was a lot warmer than the rest of us. <laughs> but anyway, if you're like a, if you want to give that a try sometime, uh, give that a try. It's a, a good venture to give it a shot. See how it works. Nice dry clothes. You haven't sweated in them all day. <laughs> the head roll. I think everybody that's watched my videos knows that I have a preference that I always carry a machete and a knife. Okay, the machete is the uh, the heavy chopper, and then the knife is for fine carving, whittling, carving, feathering. Now, for those of you 
who just carry a big knife, sometimes the fine carving chores can be a little tedious with them. The chopping chores are okay, but the fine carving chores are not. Now, I saw a guy one time in a video, and he was saying that whenever you're doing fine carving with the big knife, you can control it better if you will put the lanyard on your arm like this and hold on to the blade. Now that may support the back of the blade a little bit, but as you can see, it has plenty of room to flop around. Okay. Now there is a there's a way that you can have you can do it that way if you want to, but that just doesn't work for me. But there's a way that you can do this where you'll have better control over the knife, and I'll show you how I do that. Instead of having the knife rigged up like this right here, where it'll flop in the back. What you can do is carry you a little extra piece of uh, a little extra loop of uh, cordage, uh, paracord, leather cord, whatever. And what you do is you just simply loop it through, and you're adding an extra loop to it. What you're going to do is that thing is going to come, the way to measure it for your machete is you want it to come about three fingers width away from the tip of your blade. Alright, now the way that's going to work is what you're going to do is you're going to put either your pinky or your last two fingers in it. And see how I'm holding on to the back, the tip of the blade? I now have complete control over the back of the knife, not to mention if it moves around. I can feel it. This is just something that's kind of hard to explain on camera, kind of hard to show, but whenever you're doing this, you'll have very, very fine control over your fine carving or whatever it is that you want to do. Just a little something. There'll be, there'll be different reasons for this. But just give that a try because your hand, you'll have the feel over what's going on over the back of the blade by having your last two fingers in there and holding on to the top part of the blade. Another thing you can do is you can put your thumb in it and reach up here and you can grab the blade this way. And there's certain things you can do with a blade like this. Anything that you can feel to pick up the back of the blade with will help. Well, that concludes part one. And uh, <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to end each video with a question. <laughs> a question that I can't answer, that I haven't been able to find the answer, and I'd really like the answer to it. <laughs> so the question for the end of part one is, let's talk a little bit about these uh, woodland camo pants here. And these woodland camo pants here. All right. Now maybe somebody's going to know. What I want to know, okay? There's a difference between these two, and nobody's ever been able to tell me. But I've got a sneaking suspicion of what it is. This is just plain woodland camo cloth. Pull you in close. See how it's just plain woodland camo cloth. You can see the different colors: the black and the brown and the green. Now, somebody told me these are the winter pants, the cold weather pants. Because if you look at these, some of the pants that you'll get, see how they have the little lines sewn in them? I don't even know if the light's picking it up or not. Hopefully you can see that. But somebody had told me that any time you get this, the uh, military-type pants that have these lines in them, that those are the hot weather pants. Okay, I'm going to hold the two up side by side. I don't know if you can see the difference or not. But, anybody, cut this thing off. But, anybody that will know the difference in them is going to know what they're for. I know you've seen them before. Some of them, they just like, they're like a smooth cotton-like fabric. 
and then some of them you could see lines sewn in different directions okay that is my question to you <laughs> so if anybody if anybody knows the answer to that let me know okay put it in the comment section and i shall see you in part two